So let's continue on with our genetic notes. Um, so with Mendel and his peas, continuing with um, Mendel and working with his peas and his genetics and all of that, um, we're talking about all those terms which you are hopefully familiar with, homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant. Um, he created a couple different laws with the way that he combined them and looked at them and crossed them and so on. So, the first law that he came up with was his law of segregation. With the law of segregation, and remember we talked about law versus theory. A law is what happens and a theory is why it happens. So a law is what happens, a theory is why it happens. And a law is often proven by math. So if Mendel made a law, we can prove this by using math equations. Um, and we can. We can see his laws by using a Punnett square and getting the same results multiple times by using this Punnett square. So, um, Mendel's theory, or Mendel's law of segregation is using homozygous pea plants with two alleles, the big P, big P, and little P, little P, and he crossed the homozygous dominant and the homozygous recessive, and he was able to get heterozygous combinations. So, therefore, whenever you have a homozygous and dominant and homozygous recessive crossed, you're going to get a heterozygous. Now, the reason we have this happening is because we have, this is one parent, but the parents can only give one of these alleles. It can't give both. So this would be like if it was the parent, this is um, a diploid situation. So it can only give this one or this one to its offspring. It can't give both to the offspring. So in this case, because it's homozygous recessive, the only choice it has to give is a little p. And in that case, with the homozygous dominant, the only choice it has is to give a big P. So when it crosses, really the only combination we can end up with is a heterozygous individual. One of them is going to give a big P, one of them is going to give a little P. So the offspring is going to get a big P from one, a little P from the other, and we're going to have a heterozygous individual. There's really not any other option we can come up with. It's a heterozygous individual. And this is based on um, how they segregate out. So one parent has a homozygous dominant set, other parent has a homozygous recessive set. When you separate them out by the meiosis process, you're gonna get homozygous um, four haploid dominant alleles and four haploid recessive gametes. And then when they fertilize, this is the combination you're going to get is a heterozygous individual. So then we start to learn about Punnett squares. You guys have all done Punnett squares before, right? Okay, good. So when we do Punnett squares, the Punnett squares are pretty simple to use. And hopefully you have the Punnett squares and you remember them, you're familiar with them, they're pretty simple because we will be using Punnett squares a lot. This basic like tic-tac-toe Punnett square is for what we call a monohybrid cross. A monohybrid cross is looking at one trait, mono for one. We will be doing what's called a dihybrid cross for more complicated looking at two traits at the same time. Because this is a college class, we will take it up a notch and look at two traits at the same time. But starting off with basic one cross. So with this type of cross, this is an F1 generation. F1 is referring to the first generation, which is called a filial one. Now, we can also talk about a filial two generation. You guys are really going to want to pay attention to this stuff. Did I mention there are three sets of genetic problems? They get progressively harder. Okay, this isn't your middle school stuff we're going to talk about. You're going to be lost. So Punnett squares um, of F1 generation is the first resulting generation. Now, you've got the parent generation, then you get the F1 generation, then you get the F2 generation. And when we start to do these genetic
kind of problems, you're going to want to pay close attention to the question which generation you are it's asking for. So for instance, um, if we're thinking of my family, my parents would be the P generation, the parents generation. Then me and my siblings would be the F1 generation. Then my children would be the F2 generation, which would be filial two generation. So that's how it would be counted. If I had grandchildren one day, that would be the filial three generation or the F3 generation. So when we do a cross, we put one set of parents on one side and one set of parents on the other side, and then you just bring it down. So this would be little p, little p, big p, big p, and then you just cross it this way, a, p, a little p here, a big p here, and this would be the individual. So in this case, since this is homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, all of these are going to be heterozygous. Because heterozygous in this case, the dominant allele hides the recessive allele, and all of these are heterozygous, all of the plants are going to be purple because they all have one dominant allele. The dominant allele hides the recessive allele, and so all of them are going to be purple. So this Punnett square is for a monohybrid cross, mono again, because we're looking at one particular trait. And that one particular trait is whether that is purple or white. The only way we would get a white plant is if we had a two um, little p's or two recessive alleles. So there are no recessive alleles present except in the, except them being hidden by the dominant allele in the heterozygous condition. So we do have recessive alleles, they're just hidden. So that means that we see this trait skip a generation. We don't have any whites, they're skipping a generation because they're all being hidden in the population. The recessive trait is still there, it's just being hidden. So this is a good example of how, yes, a recessive trait may not show up, it's just being hidden in this generation. So here are some examples of how the Punnett square works. You have to be familiar with how this works because we will be using Punnett squares a lot. Again, three sets of genetic problems. And when I say three sets of genetic problems, I'm talking several pages each for these genetic problems. They're not gonna be anything that's really simple. It's gonna take a little bit of work with these. Today we'd like to talk to you about how oh, to use a plan. I'm 13 minutes of this. I didn't realize that one was that long. Today we'd like to talk to you about... Okay, we're going to skip both of those things. Okay. So sometimes we don't know what an individual is. So we may do something called a test cross. A test cross is trying to figure out what combination the parent has. So whenever we do a test cross, we always combine it with a recessive individual. So here's how a test cross would work. So for instance, um, oh, let me think of a good example. Um, my husband, so this is, we'll just do me, okay? My blood type I know is OO, okay? I have recessive blood and the blood types that you have, you can have A, B, A, B, or O. O is considered recessive blood. I know my blood type is O, okay? I have always known that. My mother has O blood, I have O blood. Now, my husband has A blood. So I'm just gonna write his name as Chris, okay? I'm not supposed to say his first name, but I know he has A blood. He could have AO or he could have AA. I don't know which it is. I just know that he has A blood, okay? I don't know which one he has. I just know that he has A. So, to figure out what kind of blood he has, we could do a test cross. And we kind of actually did a test cross. To do a test cross, you cross with a recessive individual, which is me, okay? We crossed it with me, which is a recessive individual. So, we don't know what his other thing is, but we crossed it with a recessive. I can only give my children a recessive trait. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, because I'm recessive. I can only give my children an O. That's all I have to give my children. They all got my O allele, okay? That's all I have. I'm O blood. That's all I have to give my children. My husband had to have at least one A. So. He gave my children an A. Of my four children, 
all of my children have A blood. So what do you think is most likely his blood type? Do you think it's most likely this or this? A. 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 It is most likely AA because of four children, one of them probably would have ended up O if he had this one. Does that make sense? Yeah, if he had AO, there is a likelihood that one of my children would have ended up O blood too. But the fact that I did not have any children with O blood, it is most likely that all of my children are like that. Does that make sense? So we were able to figure out my husband's blood type by doing a test cross, okay? I mean, it was kind of an unintentional test cross. Now, here's another example of how this worked, okay? So, we'll do another example using my parents. My mom is also OO. My dad is A. He could be AO or he could be AA. But we automatically know what my dad is. What is my dad? How do we know that? Exactly. My dad has to be AO because the only way I could be OO is if my dad was AO. That's the only way that I could have OO blood. Now my siblings, because I have four siblings, um, there's one other child that's OO, and then there's a couple other that are A. Um, but I think there's only one other that's OO. So it makes sense that my dad had to have been AO because that's the only way I could have ended up OO. I got the recessive from my dad and my mom could only have given her O. So all the other children ended up AO too. So that's how a test cross works. The only way you can figure out what an individual is in a test cross is by combining with a recessive trait. So you can do this with any individual. If you don't know what they are, they could be a homozygous dominant or they could be a heterozygous. All you have to do is cross them with a recessive individual and you can figure it out. Now, do you want to go do this with humans? No. Did we accidentally do it with me? I mean, yes, but you can do it unintentionally, but don't go doing it with humans. But you can do it with plants easily enough. I mean, you can go cross some plants with a test cross. You can do it in a lab, but don't go doing it with humans. Okay, so test cross results. If, the, um, if you end up with some heterozygous traits or a homozygous recessive, you can figure out what the individual is. So this is in Google Classroom. This is an example of what a test cross is. You don't know if this one is homozygous dominant or heterozygous, but you do know this one's recessive because all it's got to give is recessive. So you do a test cross. If they all end up dominant, then you know that it had to have been a dominant allele. If you get some recessive ones in the population, then you know it had to have been heterozygous. So you can do a test cross to figure out what type of parent it was. All right, monohydric cross. Did that make sense? Did test cross make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You gotta cross it with a recessive individual. Because some of your genetic problems will ask about test crossing. All right, so monohydric crossing. Breeding experiments in which the individuals identically um, heterozygous for one gene are crossed. So in a monohybrid cross, you're looking at one trait, eye color, plant color, if the plant is tall or short, if the blood type, that's monohybrid. You're looking at one trait only, testing for one trait. Generally, if you're doing a monohybrid cross, you're looking at three generations. You've got the parent, You've got the first generation, which is called filial one, and then you've got the second generation, which is called filial two. So three generations, parent, first generation, second generation. My parents, me, my children. 
That's what we're looking at for a monohybrid cross. When you're doing your genetic problems, pay attention. It may ask, what is the F1 generation phenotype? Or what is the F2 generation phenotype? And I will warn you, there will be genetic problems on your test. So make sure you are comfortable with these genetic problems. There will be genetic problems on the test. Are the genetic problems just a monohybrid cross? There will be dihybrid ones too on the test. But they will be the same or very, very similar to the ones that you do in your problem. I think... I think they're almost exactly the same as the genetic problems. So like the ones that you do in your genetic problems, they're the exact same as the ones in the test. So. Maybe I changed like a word, but they're almost like the exact same. Show up there, out of nowhere, if you walk out your... No, man, she's just walking around the mall, and you're walking around, and then some of you. She's just going to ignore you. Yes, she is. I'm pretty sure when I got my golden doodle, it was an F2. It said that before its name. You got your what? Then that no. would probably mean it was like two generations of them. My dog's an F1. He's a pure bro. Uh, <laughs> pretty sure my dad has so long as this. I think he's an inbred. <laughs> <laughs> he might yeah. be. Does he like a cleft foot? Like, what's up with his foot? He's got a lot of dogs. Okay, this is in Google Classroom, but it shows kind of how it works. Um, in this case, we're looking at whether the um, pea plant is a tall or a short. Tall is the dominant trait, short is the recessive trait. But we've got the parent generation. It's true breeding. So remember, a homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive would be true breeding. And so in our parent generation, we've got true breeding for tall, true breeding for short, and then we get our cross, which produces an F1 generation that is heterozygote. Then we cross that generation, and that's gonna give us the F2 generation, which is going to have a ratio um, of one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. Um, so this is basically looking at different characteristics. So we've got round versus wrinkled, seed shape, seed color, pod texture, pod color. So Mendel looked at all of these. He looked at all of these different things. He looked not just at color, but like, is the seed round or wrinkled? Is it yellow or green? Is it smooth or wrinkled? He looked at all of these different traits and figured out that these have these dominant or recessive traits for all of these different things. Pretty impressive. So in a monohybrid cross between two heterozygous individuals, the two types of gametes can meet in different ways. A big A and a big A, a big A and a little a, little a and big A, and a little a and a little a. And so you can get these different combinations. Big A, big A, heterozygous, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. So you're gonna get some unique ratios. And I tried to color co coordinate it to represent like a blue for male and then the pink for female. Or blue for sperm, pink for egg. I know that's kind of gender basis, but sorry. I tried to be consistent. But, this is where it's important. Phenotypic and genotypic ratio. What Mendel found out is when you follow this pattern, the phenotypic ratio is going to end up three to one, and the genotypic ratio is going to end up one to two to one. So this is what it means. Three to one color. So you're gonna get three purple flowers
flowers to one white flower. So all of these are going to be purple, and this is going to be white. Three to one ratio for phenotype. The phenotypic ratio of a monohybrid cross is going to be three to one. And then you're going to get a one to two to one genotypic ratio. One homozygous dominant to two heterozygous to one homozygous recessive. One to two to one. So this is another time you need to pay attention to the question that is asked. It will ask you what is the phenotypic ratio of the F2 generation. And so you're going to need to say a 3 to 1 ratio or a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio depending on what the question asks. So is that pay one attention. One to it, the genotype. The genotype is 1 to 2 to 1. So a 1 homozygous dominant to 2 heterozygous to 1 homozygous recessive. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. But the phenotype is 3 purple to 1 white. Mm -hmm. So make sure you're paying attention to what the question is asking. How do we tell if it's a phenotype or a genotype? Phenotype is like the physical color. So in this case, anything that has a dominant allele will be a dominant phenotype, which is a purple flower. Does that make sense then? Kind of. So like both ones that are like shaded are like the phenotype? Yes. Yeah, because they have a big A in it, and the big A will be purple. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. But then when you look at like the actual how it's written, big A, big A, there's only one big A, big A. Big a. And there's only one little a, little a, but there's two big a, little a's. And uh, how do you tell what, which one's F1 and F2? Um, so F1, F1, one, was, um, so the parent generation was A, A times A, A which made this, okay? Does that make sense? You took those? And then... Can I go to the right here? Yes. So that's F2, okay? So then that. So this would make, this is the F2 when you combine that. So F2 is a, 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 A. Does that make sense now? Yeah. Okay. So the original was the two true breeding, which made this. Then you took two of these together to make this. Does that help? Okay. is a 75% probability of having purple, purple flower phenotype. So basically you have a 75% chance of having purple flower. So that's basically saying if this is 100%, 75, and this is 25 because each of these represents 25, 75% chance of having purple flowers and 25% chance of having a white flower. So all we did was take that Punnett square and turn it into a percent. Everybody still with me? Yeah. Cut. A monohybrid cross is a cross between two parents that breed true for different versions okay, of a single trait. In this example, that trait is flower way. color. The allele that specifies purple flowers is dominant over the allele that specifies white flowers. The purple flower plant has two dominant alleles at the locus that governs flower color. It will produce only gametes that carry these alleles. The white flower plant has two recessive alleles at the locus that governs flower color. It will produce only gametes that carry these alleles. We can use this Punnett square to predict the probable gamete combinations and genotypes of the offspring. This shows the predicted first generation, or F1, genotypes. 
And these are the F1 phenotypes. In all offspring, the dominant allele will mask the recessive allele, and the offspring will be purple. Now suppose two of the F1 plants are crossed. Once again, we can use a Punnett square to predict the genotypes of the offspring. There are two phenotypes, and the ratio of dominant to recessive phenotypes is 3 to 1. Let's have to jump up there for sure. Maybe I'll move that in months. Yeah, the one day it's pooped on you. You know, it's hilarious. You <laughs> we weren't there doing a test. No, it was there the test of the last time. Yeah, we should, we should, time we should call Dicks and see if that guy's working. Clean them up. All right, so, um, Mendel's law of independent assortment is the gene pairs on one chromosome get sorted into gametes independently of genes on a pair of another chromosome. And he used Punnett squares also to predict this type of inheritance. So um, he was able to use the Punnett squares to help him predict this as well. So this is another one of his laws that he was able to use or able to determine. Hey Brody. Come on. So, you know when you're like the first one to get lunch? Yeah. Do they get mad at you? No. You're gonna start doing it. Hey Brody, whenever it's like juniors or seniors at first, you still get there with them? Yeah. What? Dude, we gotta start doing it. Yeah, this guy wants to get out of mine. Yeah, this guy wants to get out of mine. I don't think there's time to go there. Those chocolate ones? Yeah, he got in the bag. Bag of grapes and full bag of chocolate. That is not a good trade. For him. Even with only two chromosomes, there are two possible alignments of homologous chromosomes during metaphase one. In one case, 
both chromosomes carrying the dominant alleles could be positioned together on the same side of the spindle equator. Alternatively, the chromosomes carrying the dominant alleles could be positioned on opposite sides of the spindle equator. Each alignment would produce two allele combinations for a total of four possible genotypes in the resulting gametes. Because of independent assortment, the inheritance of alleles at the A locus does not influence the inheritance of alleles at the B locus. Alright, so that's all we're covering today. We will have some more notes tomorrow. You do need to make sure you're getting your face lab finished up because that is due tomorrow even with the snow day. It wasn't a very long lab, so you should have plenty of time to get that done. I am looking forward to seeing what your children look like. I've already seen some very interesting pictures, so I'm very excited to see what your offspring look like. Any questions? Have you seen our model yet? <laughs> I have not.